Um, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Sunny climbs of Western Japan. 26th of March, 2021. Um, welcome to uh, episode 397 of the Corbett Report, Exposing Biden's Secret Plans. Now, um, you'll excuse me if I'm a little bit on edge right now. It's just that I have the documents. I have the secret plans of the Biden administration that I have managed to um, exfiltrate from my secret sources, secret insider sources, anonymous, of course, that I can't let you know about. But it means that uh, I have to be very careful. This is the kind of information that could get you killed. Oh, wait, what am I talking about? No, of course, that's clickbait nonsense. No, secret plans, anonymous sources. Trust me, guys, I'll tell you the truth from my secret anonymous. No, that is not how the Corbett Report works. So really, welcome to episode 397, exposing Biden's secret plans, which, of course, I am not referring to some secret pilfered documents that are uh, hidden behind 17 layers of classified secrecy. I'm talking about this March edition, March 2020 edition of Foreign Affairs, which my very well-informed, hardcore Corporate Report viewers will already know by now, of course, is the official publication of the Council on Foreign Relations, and you will know all about the CFR and its relation to the American political system and its relationship to the RIIA mothership back in England and all of that. You'll know all about that, and you will know the importance of an editorial penned by penned by Joseph R. Biden that appeared in this March 2020 edition of Foreign Affairs um, about America and America's place in the world in a future Biden administration. So you will know, you will already be well situated to know if you are a hardcore Corbett Report devotee, the importance of this type of article and the incredibly important pieces of information it can contain about the future for example, you will know the context of the long telegram, George Kennan's infamous long telegram published in Foreign Affairs in 1947, which set the table for the Cold War and formed a lot of the rhetoric and the ideas and thinking around the containment strategy and all of that that uh, ultimately resulted in Cold War 1.0, a point that we referenced recently in New World Next Week, talking about the uh, Long Telegram 2.0 that was recently published uh, at the tail end of the Trump administration. Yeah, so you'll know the importance of that type of article or, for example, Richard N. Gardner's 1974 article on the hard road to world order. You will not only know about that article, you will have read it and read about the, uh, the idea of surpassing national sovereignty by building globalist institutions from the ground up and doing an end run around sovereignty, the hard road to world order, which you will also already know was the inspiration for the title of Patrick Wood's second book on technocracy, Technocracy, the Hard Road to World Order, which I talked about with Patrick Wood. Uh, you'll know, for example, the infamous 1993 foreign affairs article by Samuel P. Huntington on the Clash of Civilizations, which introduced to the wider public the uh, essentially what was going to be the guiding ideology of the first couple of decades of the 21st century and maybe the tail end of the 20th century, and uh, which, of course, resulted in Clash of Civilizations 1.0, which I've talked about before, for example, in Questions for Corbett, and which ultimately, of course, is inevitably leading to Clash of Civilizations 2.0, which I've written about in my uh, weekly subscriber editorial newsletter. So yes, uh, you can garner extremely important pieces of information about the globalist plans and uh, where the globalists are seeking to take uh, the world from this very publicly available document. But I know that there is a certain section of the crowd that is only interested in super secret, classified, anonymous source stuff that, oh, I have the inside information, trust me, guys, and uh, it becomes an infotainment game because, unfortunately, people have been programmed by Hollywood to expect that all of that kind of inside knowledge, 007-type shenanigans is what is the par for the course for in a collection of valuable intelligence, but that is not the case, and, in fact, that is the founding ethos of the Corbett Report. Open source intelligence news has been the tagline of the website since the very beginning because, as I noted at the time and have continued to note ever since, the intelligence agencies get most of their actionable, valuable information from completely open sources. Back in the day, newspapers, radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, etc. In our current day and age, of course, a lot of that is freely available online, including this editorial that we're going to be referencing today. 
um, by Joseph R. Biden in the pages of Foreign Affairs, which I have the hard copy um, because I saw it when it came out and thought it would probably be valuable. Um, but uh, if you don't happen to have a hard copy, don't worry. Please don't give your money or your clicks to the CFR. We will do an end run around the Foreign Affairs, uh, the CFR website and Foreign Affairs uh, online to archive.is where you can skip over the paywall and you can read the whole article for free and you don't have to give them any clicks. So uh, obviously that will be linked up in the show notes for today. Um, but uh, yeah, now let me stop. Obviously anyone who was only clicking on this because of the clickbaity, super secret inside knowledge stuff, well, it was nice knowing you. Please stop watching. I'm not joking. I'm not being facetious. I do not want that as part of my audience. Now, for everyone else who's left, you may have a reasonable objection to this, or at least a seeming performative contradiction that I'm performing here. But James, you dear informed Corbett Report listener, will say, weren't you just telling us about precedent Trump and that the fact that the, these shadows on the cave wall are just paraded out in front of the public to keep them distracted from the reality? And I would say, yes, absolutely. And I'm glad that you point that out. And I will counter by pointing out uh, something that I've noted recently in, in one of my uh, editorials that I wrote. Um, uh, yes, President Trump, the shadows on the cave wall. But the shadows actually tell us something about physical objects in the real world that are being used to cast the shadows. So if we want to extend the metaphor that far, we will say that actually scrying the shadows for what the people who are actually manipulating the shadows are doing is important. To put it back in the context of the 3D chess game that I've been talking about recently, specifically in my editorials, I'll go back to the way that I opened my most recent subscriber editorial on China, the Quad, and the Next Great War, where I, where I wrote, The stage is now being set for the next great war on the so-called Grand Chessboard. As anyone who's being pay paying attention to global geopolitics in recent years will know by now, the U.S. Empire, the U.K., the U.S., the U.K., Israel, the Five Eyes allies, NATO, and their regional allies and vassals, etc., etc., are preparing to square off against China and the axis of evil, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and any state that provides any resistance to the U.S. empire for global control in the 21st century. And, as readers of this column will be uniquely situated to understand, this entire conflict is part of a 3D chess game that is taking place over and above the regular 2D nation-state chessboard that we are being asked to fixate on. However, there is a 2D chess game going on, and it is part of the problem-reaction solution that the 3D chess players are using to bring about their agenda. So today, let's examine the latest moves on the Grand Chess Board and see what they reveal about the globalist plan for total control. And I will commend the rest of that editorial to your attention. I think it is one of the most pressing issues geopolitically going forward into the 2020s, and I... I'm pretty certain that's going to play out in a number of very important ways over the course of this decade. Um, but it's more specifically with regards to this article itself, I think it's important that we uh, also situate this in that context. Yes, obviously this is pro propaganda and obviously it contains a lot of the mealy-mouthed political propaganda types of lies that are used to distract the public. But knowing about the... The, the, the sort of lies that they're employing and how and why and what propaganda buzzwords they're using and what, what agenda items they are concentrating on is important for understanding the way that this game is being set up so that we can better understand it and in the end, as I always come back to, better walk away from it, withdraw our support from it, take our time, energy, and attention elsewhere. I think we would be uh, in a better situation and better able to do that, the better we uh, understand the enemy that is uh, lining up against us. And the enemy isn't the Biden, Biden administration itself. No, that is a, a subset, a vassal of the real enemy who is puppeteering all of this from behind the scenes. So... I think it is important to parse this propaganda. So we're going to do the uh, unpleasant but necessary work of plugging our nose and plowing through this editorial. Uh, specifically, it's called Why America Must Lead Again, Rescuing U.S. Foreign Policy After Trump by Joseph R. Biden Jr. And as I say, by Joseph Biden Jr. Yeah, of course, obviously this was written by his team, his handlers, whatever. But at any rate, it obviously says something about the direction they are looking to take the U.S. and more broadly speaking, more importantly speaking for us non-Americans, the globe in the coming years. And uh, it contains some interesting nuggets. Um, let's dive into it. Just Let's just start reading um, from the top and note some of the 
some of the mealy mouth political blather, but some of the directions that that blather is tending. So, for example, um, he starts by saying, By nearly every measure, the credibility and influence of the United States in the world have diminished since President Barack Obama and I left office on January 20th, 2017. President Donald Trump has belittled, undermined, and in some cases abandoned U.S. allies and partners. He has turned on our own intelligence professionals, diplomats, and troops. He has emboldened our adverse adversaries and squandered our leverage to contend with national security challenges from North Korea to Iran, from Syria to Afghanistan to Venezuela, with practically nothing to show for it. He has launched ill-advised trade wars against the United States' friends and foes alike that are hurting the American middle class. He has abdicated American leadership in mobilizing collective of action to meet new threats, especially those unique to this century. Most profoundly, he has turned away from the democratic values that give strength to our nation and unify us as a people. Meanwhile, the global challenges facing the United States, from climate change and mass migration to technological disruption and infectious diseases, have grown more complex and more urgent with the rapid advance of authoritarianism, nationalism, and illiberalism has undermined our ability to collectively meet them. Democracies paralyzed by hyperpartisanship, hobbled by corruption, weighed down by extreme inequality, are having a harder time delivering for their people. Trust in democratic institutions is down. Fear of the other is up. And the international system that the United States so carefully constructed is coming apart at the seams. Trump and demagogues around the world are leaning into these forces for their own personal and political gain. The next U.S. president will have to address the world as it is in January 2021, and picking up the pieces will be an enormous task. He or she will have to salvage our reputation, rebuild confidence in our leadership, and mobilize our country and our allies to rapidly meet new challenges. There will be no time to lose. So that's how he sets up this editorial. And yes, as you can see, the blah, blah, blah that you would expect from a a, not even a presidential political co candidate at the time that this was penned and at the time that it was submitted for foreign affairs. Uh, it was a primary candidate, a, a candidate in the Democratic primaries. He hadn't even won anything at that point. So uh, keep that in mind. And also keep in mind, obviously, this is from the, uh, the March-April 2020 edition of Foreign Affairs, which was on the newsstands in March 2020, which means that this Editorial was written at some point prior to that. I would venture to say probably months prior to that point. But at any rate, when COVID-19 and the big coronavirus scare and all of that was still just a twinkle in the eyes of the Event 201 criminals, this was already uh, ready and set in the print uh, to, to go to press. So keep that in mind as some of this emerges throughout this. Um, Let's just look at some of the things that are being stressed here. Of course, you know, U.S. allies and partners, we have to bring everyone back into the fold uh, That's that's been so thrown into chaos over the last four years. We have to somehow get order from that chaos, as if that was the plan all along. Um, national security challenges from North Korea to Iran, from Syria to Afghanistan to Venezuela. Wow, surprise, surprise. All of the same enemies that were the enemies under the Trump State Department. Uh, you know, oh, we've got to get those Syrians. we got to get those Iranians. we got to get those Venezuelans. Oh, wait, it's all the same. Um, we can't leave Afghanistan. It's only been uh, 18, 19, 19 years? Uh, going on 20 years, I guess. Uh, anyway, it hasn't been long enough. Um, mobilizing collective action to meet new threats, a.k.a., of course, we need to have big glo international alliances to, to work on these big problems from climate change, of course, the trillion-dollar climate swindle, um, which isn't just a swindle. It is, of course, on a deeper level, also carbon eugenics that is tending towards technoc technocratic tyranny. That is what is at base. If you do not understand that, please watch or rewatch Why Big Oil Conquered the World until you understand it. Um, mass migration to technological disruption and infectious diseases. So again, before anyone was thinking or talking about coronavirus or COVID-19, other than being some sort of bat soup thing going on in Wuhan, uh, Joseph R. Biden was already uh, waving the flag about that. So yes, as to be expected, ginned up threats, boogeymen are going to be used in th to rally the world around collective action. We got to get our allies back on board so that we can all collectively blah, blah, blah. Okay, yada, yada. Let's skip ahead in this editorial to an interesting proposal. Um, let's see if, if this actually comes to fruition. But at any rate, this is what was being penned last year. During my first year in office, the United States will organize and host a global summit for democracy 
to renew the spirit and shared purpose of the nations of the free world. It will bring together the world's democracies to strengthen our democratic institutions, honestly confront nations that are backsliding, and forge a common agenda. Building on the successful model instituted during the Obama-Biden administration with the Nuclear Security Summit, the United States will prioritize results by galvanizing significant new country commitments in three areas. Fighting corruption, defending against authoritarianism, and advancing human rights in their own nations and abroad. As a summit commitment of the United States, I will issue a presidential policy directive that establishes combating corruption as a core national security interest and democratic responsibility, and I will lead efforts internationally to bring transparency to the global financial system, go after illicit tax havens, seize stolen assets, and make it more difficult for leaders who steal from their people to hide behind anonymous front companies. All right, some interesting and and completely 100% ex- expected, but still interesting parts of the agenda are being revealed here. I mean, first of all, this whole summit for democracy, again, being planned in the pre-COVID world where people could actually meet in, in actual physical flesh. I would assume if that does take place this year, it's going to be some sort of virtual thing, right? Yay. It'll be on Zoom and we can all watch in. Yay. Um, so uh, for the uh, renew the spirit and shared purpose of the nations of the free world, aka to make sure everybody's on board with the globalist agenda, the forge, the common agenda that he goes on to talk about. And uh, it's interesting, of course, uh, talking about fighting corruption, defending against authoritarianism, advancing human rights in their own nations and abroad. We all know how to read that diploma speak by now. That, of course, means any nation that is in the crosshairs of the State Department or the NATO allies will will suddenly be, you're doing this, you're, we found this human rights violation over here, you're not treating these people over there fairly. And to be fair, most of the time, that's probably accurately true. But then again, of course, it also simultaneously means looking at nothing that any allied country is doing. No, what are you talking about? Human rights violations? That's only them, of course. So it's just rhetoric that is used as a weapon, as we all know. If you don't know about that, I might commend to your attention, for example, um, our R2P, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the wars of aggression, something along those lines. It was a podcast episode I did many years ago about using, of course, humanitarian intervention to save the poor people of Libya as the weapon that it is, just as a convenient tool to get your foot in the door, militarily speaking, in a foreign country. And of course, as we have all seen, for example, in Libya, once the place goes to complete rot, everything falls apart, everything starts devolving, there's open air slave markets, etc., Who cares? That was yesterday's news. Gaddafi was the evil tyrant. He was the new Hitler. And we got rid of him. Therefore, the story ends happily. And who cares what happens after that point? Because it was never about humanitarian intervention. Again, I know you know that, but we have to explicitly point that out when we see it. Another interesting part of this um, that is mentioned here specifically, the I will lead efforts to bring transparency to the global financial system. Oh, great. Who doesn't like transparency? There's no possible ulterior motive or agenda that could possibly be at play there. Right, guys? Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, of course, the translation, that is talking about a global financial system, which I have identified in a lot of work I've done over the years on the global tax grid. So type global tax grid into my search bar. You will find a lot of search results on that topic, the most recent of which may be my uh, uh, editorial on the global government is preparing a global tax regime, which goes into some depth about the types of organizations that are involved in this, the types of documents that they've already been working on for years, quietly behind the scenes, ones that were being forwarded at that time in 2019, and that are still continuing to be worked on. And if you need evidence for that, well, wouldn't you know it, newly minted uh, uh, Secretary Treasury under the Biden administration, the former Fed chair herself, Janet, there will never be another recession in my lifetime, Yellen, has gone on record to explicitly state that this is exactly what the U.S. now in the Biden administration is working with the OECD and presumably all the other globalist institutions on constructing the the building blocks and cornerstones of what is the global tax grid. He's been clear about the tax proposals that he would consider. One of those would be Um, an increase in 
the corporate income tax rate back to, to 28 percent, um, coupled with reform of the guilty to reduce the incentives of American companies to uh, move their activities abroad to offshore activities. And we're actively engaged in OECD negotiations that would make it possible to do that without negatively impacting the competitive positions of American businesses. We've had a global race to the bottom in corporate taxation, and we hope to put an end to that and in that context um, to collect more than the 1% of GDP corporate tax revenue that we now collect, which is very low and among the lowest of developed countries. Aw, did you hear that? Old Yellen is looking after us after all. I mean, she cares so much about the little guy. She's going after the big corporate tax cheats. That's who this global financial uh, in surveillance architecture is aimed at. It's aimed at the big corporations, the mega multi-billion dollar multinational co co companies that have long since bought and paid for any politician of any worth. That's, that's who they're going to go after, guys. You can... You can trust Yellen. Has she ever lied to you? Of course not. That's what it's about. And it's like everything else being sold to the public as a warm, woolly thing. Of course, everyone wants to go after these big corporate mega billionaires. Oh, but by the way, yeah, I mean, you'll get caught up in the tax grid too. But don't worry too much about that. It's We're not going after you. It's just you, you happen to get caught up in it too. This is about creating a global financial architecture. Once again, if you need clarification of that point, I beseech you to look at my previous work on the global tax grid. And I'll just point out, for example, one line from my uh, editorial on the one sentence summary of the Panama Papers, where I pointed out about the MCAA back in 2014. I wrote, another interesting connection reveals itself in an almost completely unknown treaty that was signed in 2014, reported on in only the most obscure corners of the internet. The Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement was signed by 51 countries at the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes in Berlin. In October 2014, the MCAA sets out standards for sharing tax information between signatory countries and the types of data to be shared, including account balances, interest, dividends, and sales proceeds from financial assets, not just from corporations, trusts, and foundations, but from any individuals holding assets in any signatory nation. And at the time, as I say, there were 51 that signed uh, the agreement when it was f first formed. As I go on to report, it was subsequently signed by 80 countries. Uh, that was in 2016. It's now 2021. I have not checked the latest list. I'm sure it's more than that. But at any rate, yes, a large portion of the globe is now signed up to this tax and, and financial account sharing agreement that you didn't even know existed uh, two seconds ago because no one's told you about it, but it exists. It is out there. Uh, this entire architecture has been uh, it is quietly and consistently being laid for the past 10 years, if not more, uh, through these types of agreements, through these bodies that you've never heard of that are meeting all over the place in completely out in the open. Nothing secretive or classified about it. It's just no one's told to even look there. So who would even know this exists except readers of the Corbett Report? And yes, this is about the creation of the architecture that is going to be tied into the central bank digital currencies that I've been talking about here to create the perfect financial uh, surveillance society, the global financial surveillance where literally no one will be able to go anywhere or do anything outside of the purview of their central bank and its willingness or unwillingness to allow you to participate in the economy. The entire global tax grid is part of the ultimate financial control over the planet, which is really the uh, the capstone of the, the pyramid of the global uh, New World Order jet set. So, uh, yes, and Surprise, surprise, Biden was talking about it, and of course, in the fluffy, wonderful globalist uh, terms that they always employ here. Oh, it's just about uh, financial uh, insight and, and transparency. Who doesn't like transparency? But of course, it's code for a much deeper agenda that goes much further. Please see the, sh the voluminous show notes uh, for more details on that. Um, but let's move on back towards what Biden 
quote unquote, was writing in March of last year. He wrote, uh, the summit for democracy will also include civil society organizations from around the world that stand on the front lines in defense of democracy. And the summit members will issue a call to action for the private sector, including technology companies and social media giants, which must recognize their responsibilities and overwhelming interest in preserving democratic societies and protecting free speech. Ooh, free speech. At the same time, <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, free speech cannot serve as a license for technology and social media companies to facilitate the spread of malicious lies. Those companies must act to ensure that their tools and platforms are not empowering the surveillance state, gutting privacy, facilitating repression in China and elsewhere, spreading hate and misinformation, spurring people to violence, or remaining susceptible to other misuse. We'll, we'll come up with other excuses in the future. <laughs> so, translation for anyone who needs it... Um, yeah, don't worry. To all of those people who've been screaming, oh, won't someone come in and save us from big tech? I know, the government. The government will come in and regulate them. I mean, these big tech companies are basically the government anyway. They get all these government subsidies and programs and they're working with the government behind the scenes. They practically are the government. So the government should just regulate them. <laughs> and Biden says, okay, yay. Exactly, precisely as I was talking about a couple of years ago now, warning people, this is where it's going. This is what you're going to get when you're asking, please, won't someone step in and regulate the internet? Don't worry. The Biden administration is already on it. And if you need further elaboration on that point, I will point you in the direction of newly appointed National Economic Council member for the Biden administration, Timothy Wu, who has this to say about free speech and the First Amendment. We are experiencing efforts to censor and control speech in the United States and to manipulate elections for which our traditional apparatus, the free speech, uh, the First Amendment is not well prepared. And I think one danger for us, and it goes back again to how just great the core of the First Amendment is, is that because sometimes if you think you have something figured out, it gets in the way of, of of, of thinking about how you might have to change it, right? We have this wonderful tradition and the, the finest uh, and best kind of ideals of America expressed in the First Amendment. The idea that maybe it's not meeting our challenges is hard to, hard to, to stomach. Yes, that is Biden appointee Timothy Wu asking and answering the question, is the First Amendment obsolete at the Aspen Institute a couple of years ago? And spoiler for anyone who's curious, his answer is that yes, yes, it is obsolete. And you can find out more about that by reading his 2017 article under the same name and talking about the same subject that caused quite a controversy and stir when he published it. And yes, now he's part of the Biden administration. Oh, yay. Let's bring back some some version of government control over the internet. Don't worry, guys. I don't want the fairness doctrine on the internet per se, just something that looks and acts and functions like the fairness doctrine. And by fairness doctrine, of course, we mean the unfairness doctrine, that the government will uh, let you know what, what viewpoints are allowed, what viewpoints aren't allowed, what viewpoints have to be val balanced by whatever other viewpoints. And if you want to talk about something that's not on the acceptable playing field at all, oh, oh, dear, dear. So, yes, we can look forward to more moves along that direction in the coming years, to the surprise of absolutely no one. But back to Biden and continuing on with this secret document. Uh, just in case you didn't get the point about the continuity of agenda with regards to the China boogeyman between the Trump State Department and the Biden State Department, don't worry, Joseph R. Biden has this to say. The most effective way to meet the challenge of China is to build a united front of U.S. allies and partners to confront China's abusive behaviors and human rights violations, even as we seek to cooperate with Beijing on issues where our interests converge, such as climate change, non-proliferation, and global health security. On its own, the United States represents about a quarter of global GDP. When we join together with fellow democracies, our strength more than doubles. China can't afford to ignore more than half the global economy. That gives us substantial leverage to shape the rules of the road on everything from the environment to labor, trade, technology, and transparency so they continue to reflect democratic interests and values. 
One wonders what democratic interests and values Biden is looking to help shape in when we're talking about labor, trade, technology, and transparency. <laughs> and environment, of course. Uh, but, uh, of course, in a paragraph like this one, it's quite obvious what is going on. We are seeing the, the stick confront you about human rights and violations and uh, and abusive behaviors and the, the the carrot oh well you can participate with all of us other freedom loving democracies and half of the global economy if you cooperate with us on our on the places where our interests converge like of course say it with me climate change non proliferation and global health security global health security where have I heard that before? Oh yeah, biosecurity. Oh yes, the biosecurity age that we have entered in the year 2020, slightly be slightly after these words were published, is when that began in earnest. Keep that in mind. This was all penned before the COVID-19 hysteria broke out. So, again, some very interesting and uh, very um, predictive words here, shall we say? Um, so anyway. Yes, we see the agenda marching on that way. And let's not forget China's Axis friends, who, of course, also fall under the, the same um, crosshairs, where Biden writes, As president, I will do more than just restore our historic partnerships. I will lead the effort to reimagine them for the world we face today. The Kremlin fears a strong NATO, the most effective political military alliance in modern history. To counter Russian aggression, we must keep the alliance's military capabilities sharp while also expanding its capacity to take on non-traditional threats, such as weaponized corruption, disinformation, and cyber theft. We must impose real costs on Russia for its violation of international norms and stand with Russian civil society, which has bravely stood up time and time, uh, time and again against President Vlad Vladimir Putin's kleptocratic authoritarian system. So what does all of that mean? Again, this is quite obvious to people. For example, who took me up on my exhortation yesterday on New World Next Week to read that Grey Zone article about the British government and its covert operations with uh, erstwhile independent media organizations to train Russian civil society members and members of the anti-Russian government media, etc., on how to more effectively undermine the Russian government. <laughs> but it's all in the interest of ethics and journalism or something, right, guys? Something like that. Whatever. <laughs> we'll get Reuters to fact check that for you. But yeah, those are the types of operations that, in addition to the military alliances like NATO, can be used to flex the muscles and to show, demonstrate the strength of the American allies, blah, 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 towards their... All, all, the only thing they care about is transparency, love, peace, harmony. Of course. <laughs> of course, guys. What else could this possibly be about? And, in fact, talking about the Kremlin fearing the strong NATO. Ooh, wow, he talks such a tough game. Wow, he's a strong leader. Um, we can see another continuity of agenda that I also pointed out in my edit previously mentioned editorial on China the Quad and the Next Great War, talking about the Quad. What is the Quad? The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which uh, was really beefed up under the Trump administration, specifically as Mike, we lie, we cheat, we steal Pompeo um, called for last fall. He, he was calling for the Quad, the, the Japanese, US, uh, Australian, Indian alliance to conquer the Indo-Pacific, not the Asia-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific. Um, he, he was, Pompeo was calling for that to become the Asian NATO. And lo and behold, flat, fast forward a few months and some sort of selection sideshow circus later, and you have Biden calling for the, the uh, leader summit of the Quad and uh, uh, talking about how they're going to contain China and all of this. It's the same agenda marching forward in the same way. But anyway, we need to document that um, to show people that they are watching the shadows on the cave wall and what those shadows are uh, are uh, predicting for the future. So back to Biden's article. Did I mention climate change? <laughs> I will rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement on day one of a Biden administration and then convene a summit of the world's major carbon emitters, rallying nations to raise their ambitions and push progress further and faster. We will lock in enforceable commitments that will reduce emissions in global shipping and aviation, and we will pursue strong measures to make sure other nations can't undercut the United States economically as we meet our own commitments. That includes insisting that China 
the world's largest emitter of carbon, stop subsidizing coal exports and outsourcing pollution to other countries by financing billions of dollars worth of dirty fossil fuel, ener fuel energy projects through its Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, let's, let's read between the lines here, and what is he really saying at the bottom of all of this? Oh, that's right. It's about the Belt and Road Initiative and trying to derail that. I mean, how dare you put together some sort of economic and, and, and trading uh, idea, trying to create some sort of new trading corridor and, and different agreements, bilateral trading agreements. No, 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 no. You have to stop that uh, because uh, uh, you're, uh, you're hurting the earth <laughs> with your economic development. Our economic development is great, but yours is hurting the earth, so we will put pressure on you. And it's about the earth. It's about saving the earth. Did I tell everyone it's about saving the earth? I'm such a great person. Um, and then, of course, who could forget 5G? Well, even Joseph R. Biden can't forget 5G, as he goes on to say. Uh, when it comes to technologies of the future, such as 5G and artificial intelligence, other nations are devoting national resources to dominating their development and determining how they are used. The United States needs to do more to ensure that these technologies are used to promote greater democracy and shared prosperity, not to curb freedom and opportunity at home and abroad. For example, a Biden administration will join together with the United States Democratic allies to develop secure, private sector-led 5G networks that do not leave any community, rural or low-income, behind. Ah, yay! He's not going to leave anyone behind in the deployment of 5G microwave <laughs> weapon, military weapon technology that they're deploying on the public now. Yay! Ooh. But wait, hold on. Where have I heard this kind of rhetoric before? I want to thank you all for being here to discuss a critical issue for our country's future. Winning the race to be the world's leading provider of 5G cellular communications networks. The race to 5G is a race America must win, and it's a race, frankly, that our great companies are now involved in. We've given them the incentive they need. It's a race that we will win. Oh, that's right. All the presidents are shadows on the cave wall that are being told what to say by the script writers who tell them what to say, and they don't know or understand or care. It doesn't matter if they do uh, what they are saying. Anyway, they're saying it just as Biden will, just as his predecessors did, and saying the same things about the same topics in the same way when they are real agenda items and things that need to go through for the powers that shouldn't be. Lo and behold, the president, whether it's Team Coke or Team Pepsi, will be promoting it. 5G, absolutely no different. Don't expect anything different there. So finally today, in order to take us home, we get some more mealy mouth bladder to end out this little... Um, pee on to the, uh, the wonderful regime that Biden is uh, seeking to bring in. He writes, prepared to lead. Putin wants to tell himself and anyone else he can dupe into believing him that the liberal idea is obsolete, but he does so because he is afraid of its power. No army on earth can match the way the electric idea of liberty passes freely from person to person, jumps borders, transcends languages and cultures, and supercharges communities of ordinary citizens into activists and organizers and change agents. We must once more harness that power and rally the free world to meet the challenges facing the world today. It falls to the United States to lead the way. No other nation has that capacity. No other nation is built on that idea. We have to champion liberty and democracy, reclaim our credibility, and look with unrelenting optimism and determinism toward our future, always spinning, spinning towards freedom. <laughs> Blah. All right. Yay. Okay. What a wonderful way to wrap things up. And of course, we all know Putin is always saying the liberal idea is obsolete. Do you, do you have a quotation on that? Can you, can you provide a source for that? Anyway, whatever. Who cares? We all know Putin. Biden, boo. Biden, yay! <laughs> and that's about the level of propaganda that's being put out here. And make no mistake, of course, this is propaganda, but this is propaganda of a slightly higher order than the propaganda that's meant for the, 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 the rubes, the masses of asses who watch the late night TV news or read a newspaper? Does anyone do that anymore? Well, anyway, the people who listen to the talking heads for their information, they get the bottom level, the, the slop that you put in the trough for the pigs to feed on. This is slightly better. This is for the more 
you know, the, the sort of higher level barnyard animals, the horses and what have you, that have to do some real labor, you know, you feed them slightly better to keep them in better shape. You give them slightly better propaganda that at least gives them more, of, a little more substance as to the agenda that needs to be pushed. And they'll hit on all the buttons of all the key issues. And of course, it is still propaganda and it's meant to make people, in this case, the people in the orbit of the Council on Foreign Relations, go along with the agenda that they are being told to go along with in the exact fashion that, as I've pointed out several times recently, J. Edward Griffin was referring to in the Quigley formula, rings within rings. Yes, there are the people in the inner, inner, inner part of the clique that are setting the agenda. Then there are the propaganda for the outer layers of that clique, so that they know sort of the general trend of where this agenda is going. And then there's the slop that's given to the masses that's just, here, here guys, here's what you need to know. Um, so let's recap what we've learned from this particular piece of propaganda. Uh, rah Rah USA and all our partners. Uh, peace, love, prosperity, freedom, sunshine, puppy dogs, and 5G for everybody. Yay! Uh, boo hiss to China and Russia and all those baddies and their evil, climate-changing, kleptocratic, human rights-abusing ways. Uh, we need to clamp down on your internet. We need to create a global tax grid. We need to bolster global institutions to uh, save Mother Earth or something. Um, did I miss anything? I think that's kind of the gist of what we were able to glean from that. But of course, we could go on and continue to scry the tea leaves of the super secret documents and super secret appointments that Biden has made in his super secret move towards the globalist agenda that's completely out in the open, the open conspiracy. For example, we could find out more about Biden's Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. Tony Blinken, then Obama's deputy national security advisor, also pushed for regime change in Libya. He became Obama's point man on Syria, pushing to arm the so-called moderate rebels that fought alongside al-Qaeda and ISIS and designed the red line strategy to trigger a full-on U.S. intervention. Syria, he told the public, wasn't anything like the other wars the U.S. had been waging for more than a decade. We are doing this in a very different way than in the past. We're not sending in hundreds of thousands of American troops. We're not spending trillions of American dollars. We're being smart about this. This is a sustainable way to get at the, at the uh, terrorists, and it's also a more effective way. This is not open-ended. This is not boots on the ground. This is not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's not even Libya. And the more people understand that, the more they'll understand the need for us to take this limited but effective action. Despite Blinken's promises that it would be a short affair, the war on Syria is now in its ninth year. An estimated half a million people have been killed as a result, and the country is facing a famine. Largely thanks to the policy of using wheat to apply pressure, a recommendation of Flournoy and Blinken's CNAST think tank. When the Trump administration launched airstrikes on Syria based on mere accusations of a chemical attack, Tony Blinken praised the bombing, claiming Assad had used the weapon of mass destruction sarin. Yet, there was no evidence for this claim, something then even Secretary of Defense James Mattis admitted. I cannot tell you that we had evidence, even though we certainly had a lot of media and social media indicators that either chlorine or sarin were used. While jihadist mercenaries armed with U.S.-supplied weapons took over large swaths of Syria, Tony Blinken played a central role in a coup d'etat in Ukraine that saw a pro-Russia government overthrown in a U.S.-orchestrated color revolution with neo-fascist elements agitating on the ground. Okay, yeah, seems about right. Well, how about Biden's pick for Secretary of Defense, Lloyd J. Austin III, who, as we saw back in episode 395, President Trump, uh, is currently uh, over overseeing the stand-down of the U.S. military to check the ranks for wrong think. Uh, what, what's his background? Where'd he come from? Why was he picked to head the Pentagon? Wanted to get your take on Joe Biden's cabinet picks, especially in the uh, foreign policy field. Let's start with Defense Secretary uh, General Lloyd Austin. Misgivings among some Democrats that um, and and Republicans that uh, for the second time in a row, a incoming president has picked somebody from the military who will require a waiver. What is your take on this issue of? another former general being appointed to run the Pentagon and this question of civilian leadership? I don't know the general at all. He could be the most reputable person on the face of the earth. And I'd still say what I'm going to say, which is that in a nation of 200 million adult souls, 
that pretends to be a liberal democracy, it's rather astonishing that for the second time in a row, we can't find a civilian to be the Secretary of Defense. One of the postulates, as it were, that was created by people like James Farstall and Ferdinand Eberstadt. I'm thinking of all the people who were there at the creation, if you will, of the 1947 National Security Act. And as a part of that, the defense establishment then later turned into the, the Secretary of Defense, an actual civilian over that apparatus principally at that time for budget purposes and budget control, because Truman in particular was concerned about that. Whoa, would Truman be concerned today? Uh, eight, nine billion dollar budget has turned into almost a trillion dollar budget. Uh, but that was the reason civilians were supposed to be in there. And to argue that the president's a civilian uh, is a civilian and to argue that there are other civilians involved is really to miss the point. The man who heads the most powerful cabinet department in the United States government, most powerful in terms of what he can do to the rest of the world with nuclear weapons, with the military in general, but most powerful too in the sense that he takes more money from the federal budget than anyone else by a large proportion, has to be a military officer is really kind of preposterous. He also was a member of the board at uh, Raytheon, a major weapons manufacturer, which seems par for the course amongst pretty much anyone who's ever nominated for this job. Oh, right. A former Raytheon contractor needed special clearance as a military officer to take the post. And, you know, what else is new? Okay, all right. Well, give me some good news. There's got to be some someone somewhere on this list of appointees that doesn't have a ton of dirt on him. I mean, how about the, uh, I don't know, pff, Secretary of Agriculture. And again, as we've told you before, the next president will always be worse than the previous one. Biden's handlers pick Mr. Monsanto, Tom Vilsack, to head the USDA and other farm news. Fox appointed guard of henhouse. Biden crime family just nominated one of Monsanto's best friends to head the USDA Again, during his eight years under Obama, Tom Vilsack, that's the former governor of Iowa and former America's Next Top President contestant, he earned the nickname Mr. Monsanto for approving more new GMOs than any agriculture secretary in history and, of course, making tons of money in the process for, for everybody. Well, the, the gangsters involved. Not, of course, the farmers. The Organic Consumers Association basically compiled a list of all the GMOs we have to thank Vilsack for, but I edited it down to essentially kind of like a sampler of the greatest hits. See if any of these sound like they might be part of a larger agenda. Roundup ready alfalfa, Monsanto's first GM perennial went wild, costing alfalfa growers millions. Monsanto's drought guard corn, yielding 11% less corn than conventional corn. <laughs> Roundup ready lawn grass, where Vilsack actually told the Scots miracle Grow Corporation, you don't need permits to sell GE grass commercially. It's cool. Vilsack allowed Syngenta to sell corn seeds with genetically engineered traits that were illegal in China to U.S. farmers, and the crop was rejected by markets, costing farmers one and a half billion dollars. Arctic apples don't turn brown, and also created using RNA interference technology. And finally, lab-made meat. Vilsack gave companies like Memphis Meat the green light to engineer cell cultured meat without requiring USDA inspection or labeling. And even better, a former USDA staffer of his ended up lobbying for that Memphis meat company. So there you go. China, RNA, lab-made meat. But if we go back to some classics, actually, on MediaMonarchy.com, August 21st, 2011, USDA signs with Rockefeller's Council of Foundations to exploit rural U.S., and the original question, possibly the first time I'd ever mentioned the guy's name on my website, October 2009, why are Monsanto insiders now appointed to protect food safety? Okay, of course, I give up. I don't know. I'm looking at this list of appointees and they're all about the same. Um, but what's this? U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. 
what on earth is, oh, okay, so there's some completely new thing made up for the Biden administration. Yay, now we have a special presidential envoy for climate who's going to go around the world crusading for Mother Earth. That's what it's about, guys. That's what it's about. Who is this? Oh, John Kerry. I, I think I'm familiar with John Kerry. Well, I, I wonder what he'd have to say if you tried to ask him about his plans for his time in office. Also, are you a member of, are you a member of Skull and Bones from College and Bush? Were you in the same secret society as Bush? Were you in Skull and Bones? Thank you for cutting my mic. Thank you. Right. Are you going to arrest me? Excuse me. Excuse me. What are you arresting me for? Whoa, 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 whoa. Is anybody watching this? I'm not doing this. I, uh, I think I, I'm not going to be sending any reporters to ask that question anytime soon, at least not without full um, protective gear. All right, well, once again, this is no surprise, or it should be no surprise to absolutely anyone. You don't need to be a crystal ball gazer to predict the future of these types of uh, administrations, because the changeover in administration means essentially pretty much as close to nothing as you can possibly get. Uh, the agenda, the overall agenda marches on, and as we see from their own propaganda words, of course, it is the it is the open conspiracy, the same things that they've been talking about for month after month, year after year, decade after decade, the flavor of the, uh, the Coke can changes, but it's the same thing underneath. And it's right there in the open for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. There's nothing whatsoever secretive. You don't need the secret super inside source whistleblower. Trust me, I've got an anonymous source on the inside who will tell me these things. No, it's an open conspiracy. You just need to open your eyes in order to see it. So let's use this information productively to turn to, first of all, understand the agenda, forewarn and forearm ourselves about what is coming, what they are openly saying is coming in their own words, what they are telling us is coming in the coming years, and then to find, figure out the ways that we can counteract that, which is the only important part of any of this at the end of the day. Yes, that's the, sh the shadows on the cave wall. That's where they're trying to take the whole shadow play. That is where they're trying to steer the public. Now, let's create the system that we want. Let's turn our time, attention, energy away from all of that and towards what we want and withdraw ourselves from that system and everywhere that they're trying to steer that system. And here's a hint for you if you want to know if you're doing this correctly. If you're already starting to think about the 2022 midterms or the 2024 presidential selection circus, you are doing it wrong. If you want to do it right, type Solutions Watch into the search bar of CorbettReport.com, or better yet, subscribe to the Solutions Watch RSS feed, or subscribe to my email list, or whatever. At any rate, follow Solutions Watch for things we can actually be doing to uh, prevent, or to derail, or to undermine, or to completely ignore 
what is happening in the Shadow Play universe. And uh, we will continue marching forward together. Again, don't expect a lot of coverage uh, on the Corbett Report of these types of political shenanigans in the future. I am simply laying out uh, in this time when there are people out there who are freshly um, come from the voter box and made their little check and thought things were going to change. Oh my God, maybe things won't change. Oh, maybe it's not part of that agenda. This is the time to shake people out of that tree and get them on board with reality. And I will just note parenthetically that it was actually in the recording of this podcast that I noticed that this foreign affairs uh, uh, magazine was brought to you by the auspices of their advertisers. Like who? Who could possibly be advertising in foreign affairs. Oh, that's right. Literally, the Central Intelligence Agency literally has a little recruiting ad on the back of foreign affairs, which should tell you a great deal about where this information is coming from and who it is aimed at. But yeah, if you if you want to join the CIA, guys, make sure you, you read your copy of foreign affairs, get your download of of higher order propaganda so that you know what the agenda is and then sign up so you can serve your country. Woo! <laughs> it's just, you can't make this stuff up. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again in the near future.